Okay. Okay. No, it's out here. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Aiello. I'm the president of the Sheridan Johnson County chapter of WAS. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I think we'll go ahead and um, maybe Dave, if you want to speak on the upcoming event that's happening. Do you have any upcoming events that you want to share? Uh, in April, we do. In uh, April? With the uh, Fort Hill Kearney Boys and Girls Association. So on the 27th, which I believe is a Saturday, um, we'll be uh, leading and hosting a tour to the Portuguese Ford or Portuguese House site down in KC. And Dr. Cody Newton is going to be our leader. We'll also stop at the Hook Prince Museum. Wonderful. Uh, we'll go to Foster. I'll give us a quick run through the museum, but uh, details will be coming. So uh, when we get that finalized, we'll share and then we send out to your members. Okay. Sounds good. I don't know if everybody heard that, but we're sending details out about a uh, field trip, and that'll be April 27. So, through, through the Fort Full Kearney and the Bozeman Trail Association, um, the Portuguese houses, and then the visit to the Hoofprints of the Past Museum in KC. So um, without further ado, we have Justin Horn here tonight. Justin grew up in Buffalo. He holds a BA in history from the University of Wyoming, an MA in history from the University of Nebraska Kearney, and a master's certification in museum studies from Harvard. He served six years in the U.S. Air Force as a weather forecaster and has worked with the National Park Service at Fort Laramie, Wyoming. Currently, he is a museum assistant of collections exhibits at the Campbell County Rocktown Museum in Gillette. He has published numerous articles in the Great Plains Quarterly, Annals of Wyoming, and WyoHistory.org. And that's how I found him. So thank you so much for coming tonight, Justin. Great. Thank you, Jenny, for that awesome introduction. And thank you all for coming here. Hopefully, I won't bore you too much. You could be at home watching the State of the Union. So, <laughs> hopefully, I'm a little more entertaining. So, we're going to be talking about tonight the Bone Pile Fight and the 1860s and Hope Sawyer's Exhibition. And I just want to do a short plug for my museum. So, if you happen to be in Gillette, we've got a lot going on this summer. Uh, if you like hearing me talk, I'll be talking again um, in April, on April 11th, this time on the murder of Allie Means. And with that, the murder is just the beginning of the story. And if you're into this kind of uh, 1800s expeditions, the week after that, we've got photographer and historian Paul Horstead coming to talk about the 1874 uh, Houster expedition. So to hopefully keep this a little entertaining, I'm gonna kind of present this story to you like I'm pitching a bit of a movie. And so like any good Hollywood Western, we're gonna kick off right in the middle of an action scene. So we're gonna imagine ourselves with the bluffs around us covered with Indians to five to 600 Indians and fighting commences as they charge down over the plain. Add to this that this is gonna take place at a place called Bone Pile Creek. What better name for a Hollywood Western? And we've got ourselves all set for John Wayne to come riding in. But this is not a Hollywood Western. This actually took place about 10 miles south of modern day Gillette, Wyoming. And so that, to kind of set the historical scene, we're talking about events in 1864, 1865. So big picture, American Civil War is going on. Uh, President Lincoln was assassinated in April of 65. And still in the future from what I'm gonna be talking about is the Fetterman fight, uh, Fort Phil Kearney. So you mentioned going down Portuguese Phillips site. That's all over a year in the future from what I'm gonna be talking about. So if you grew up in Buffalo like me, um, you're, that's all fresh in your memory, but the Sawyer's fight you probably aren't as familiar about. And so that's probably strike two for me at this point. I admit I'm from, I live in Gillette now. I grew up in Buffalo. You Sheridan folks aren't going to know what to do with me after this. So the first question is, what are a bunch of white guys doing in the middle of the Powder River Basin in 1865? And the answer to that is there's gold in those hills. So in 1862, prospectors found gold in Virginia, by Virginia City, Montana. And so that started a gold rush up to get to Montana. So in 1862, 1863, how the heck do you get, into, get up to Montana? And at the quickest way is following that yellow line, which is the Old Oregon Trail, or the Great Platte River Road across Southern Nebraska, enters Wyoming by Fort Laramie, kind of modern day Torrington. You cross Platte Bridge by modern day Casper, and then take the lander cutoff over to Fort Hall, Idaho. That is a heck of a long way. 
One guy who did it was a guy by the name of John Bozeman, and he went up to Virginia City and ended up striking out. He didn't have very much luck finding gold. So when he went back east, he took an eastward route to the Yellowstone River and then down, followed south, um, followed the eastern side of the Bighorn Mountains. So blazed the trail that he called the Bozeman Trail after himself and promoted as the quickest way to get to Montana. Another guy uh, also blazing a trail was famous mountain man Jim Bridger. He went up the western side of the Bighorns, followed the Bighorn River and the Bighorn Basin. But while Bridger was a better trailblazer, he wasn't quite as good a marketer as Bozeman, so Bozeman's trail got a lot more attention. Another guy looking at the map was this Congressman um, Hubbard from Iowa, and he represented the district of uh, representing Sioux City, Iowa in Congress. And so looking at the map, he thought, gee, there's probably a faster way to get to Montana, and that is to follow the Niobrara River across northern Nebraska. And that would have the advantage of successful of turning Sioux City into the main jumping off point to get to the West, making Sioux City the new gateway to the West. So he had economic motivation. And so being a congressman, he was able to get Congress to appropriate $50,000 for a Niobrara Virginia City road building expedition. And to lead that expedition, he picked a guy by the name of James Alexander Sawyers. Sawyers was originally from Tennessee. He served in the Mexican-American War and kind of like a more famous Ulysses S. Grant. After the war, he became a civilian again. And then when the American Civil War broke out, he rejoined the army, quickly rose through the ranks and Sawyers became a full bird colonel. And he commanded a unit known as the Northern Border Brigade, which was in charge of securing Northern Iowa from potential Confederate raiders. By the fall of 1864, the Civil War's moved south. Sherman's about to take Atlanta, so there's no use for this Northern Border Brigade. And so Sawyers and his men are discharged. So he's a civilian again looking for work. And so being from Sioux City, he gets in contact uh, with uh, Congressman Hubbard and they get together. And so Congressman Hubbard appoints him as the leader of the civilian expedition. So Sawyers' expedition is a civilian-led expedition along with James Sawyers is his younger brother, Newell Sawyers. And there's about 200 civilian men on this expedition, but they are able to get secure from Congress a military escort of 118 men from the 5th uh, Illinois uh, Infantry. And that falls under the command of Captain Williford. And Captain Williford and Colonel Sawyers, they do not get along. And so that comes into play as our story unfolds. So Sawyers and his men, they leave Sioux City, Iowa, go into Nebraska, follow the Niobrara River up into the Nebraska Sandhills. And like in by uh, July, 1865, they're in the Nebraska Sandhills. And so like in Moomin, we're gonna watch as the sun sets on Sawyer's expedition, and we're gonna pick up a B storyline. So our B storyline kicks off in the fall of 1864 down in Colorado more specifically at the Sand Creek Massacre in southeastern Colorado. So for lots of reasons I can't, don't have time to get into, there was a massacre by the Colorado militia against the Native Americans camped at Sand Creek. Uh, one of the guys, one of the Native Americans there was a guy by the name of George Bent, who lived a very interesting life. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read his life with George Bent autobiography, it's really interesting. But he was at Sand Creek um, and he was wounded in the hip. And then him and the survivors, they headed north, joined with their northern Cheyenne brethren and their Lakota and Sioux allies. And then in the uh, winter, January 1865, they ended up attacking Julesburg, Colorado, Fort Sedgwick, along and then continued raiding along that Great Platte River Road in Nebraska. Uh, in February, they attacked the Telegraph um, office at Mud Springs, which is by Chimney Rock, Nebraska. And just like in the movies, the story is that Mud Springs when they were under attack, they sent off a telegraph message to Fort Laramie asking for help. And before Fort Laramie could send the reply, the telegraph line got cut. So they had no idea if help was on the way. So from Fort Laramie, help was indeed on the way. Colonel William, Colonel William Collins of Fort Collins, Colorado namesake, he rode through the night with his men to relieve Mud Springs and got in a running battle with the Indians uh, known as Rush Creek, where the Indians were able to cross the frozen Platte River and Collins wisely decided not to pursue that. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention a uh, flat bridge that took place that summer. So that was a battle at Platte Bridge Station, which became Casper because one, young Lieutenant Casper Collins was killed there. Uh, he was the son of Colonel William Collins. So that's where the town of Casper gets its namesake. 
So in response to all these attacks and the increasing hostilities, uh, General Dodge, he orders his subordinate, General Connor, to make vigorous war upon the Indians to force them to keep the peace. So General Connor is at Fort Laramie, and he's beginning to plan a massive military expedition known as the Powder River Expedition. So again, Sun is going to set on Fort Laramie, and we're going to go back to our main storyline, which is Sawyer's. So Sawyer's, he's crossed uh, northern Nebraska, crossed into what is now South Dakota, crossed the White River, and then gets to the Cheyenne River. On July 23rd, he's on the Cheyenne River. And Captain Williford comes to him saying that the Army's three months worth of supplies is running out. So the Army supposedly had three months of supplies. We're a month and a half in, and the supplies are running out. So Williford blames Sawyers for not planning properly, and Sawyers blames Williford. So they're at each other's throats at this. They agree to send the quartermaster, uh, Lieutenant Dana, to Fort Laramie to get supplies. So it's going to take him 10 days to get down to Fort Laramie and back. So during that time, the main body of Sawyers, they continue following the Cheyenne River into what is now Wyoming. So I talked a little bit about Fort Laramie. I had, that's a pretty good looking soldier. I had the honor of working with the National Park Service back in 2021 at Fort Laramie as a historical interpreter. And so that's me dressed roughly as one of the soldiers that Sawyers would have had in his escort. And I'm standing next to a M1841 12 pound mountain howitzer. And that cannon, um, that type of artillery, Sawyer's, his expedition had two of those. And I was able to bring one of the uh, cannonballs that was actually recovered from the Sawyer side. So after this, you guys can come up and look at it. So Lieutenant Dana, he sent to Fort Laramie to get supplies and he comes back 10 days later. And so you can imagine Sawyer's looking, oh good, Lieutenant Dana's back with the supplies. Lieutenant, where are the supplies? Lieutenant Dana failed to get any supplies from Fort Laramie because General Connor, if you remember, is planning a huge military expedition. So all the supplies at the fort are going to General Connor. They don't have anything left for Sawyer's. So it was a failed mission to get supplies. So this makes Captain Williford, he wants to call the expedition off. We don't have enough supplies. Let's just go home. Sawyer says, heck no, we're pressing on. So they continue northward with the uh, Black Hills they can see on their east and then they get to the Belfouche River, or Sawyer's calls it the Northern Cheyenne. And at that point, they turn westward into the Powder River, the Powder River Basin. And on August 9th, they camp at a, what Sawyer's calls a stagnant Cabalo Creek. And it's interesting for us today, because in his report to Congress, Sawyer's notes, I won't read the whole quote, but they see coal seams and coal fires, and Sawyer's reports that the amount of coal they see he believes to be inexhaustible which is interesting because today, Caballo coal mine sits on that exact site. So Sawyer's is indeed on the something. So from Caballo Creek, they continue another 37 miles into the Powder River Basin and reach the um, Powder River on August 11th. And here they encounter three uh, problems, or more specifically, three problems. The first is it's August, it's dry, there's been a drought. And so they're very concerned that cattle are suffering from want of water. And they don't have Google Maps, so they don't know how far the next creek or stream is. So there's concern if they cross the powder and keep going that they're not going to have water. Uh, the next problem is that Sawyer sends out scouts to look for water, and they come back reporting that the terrain is impassable for the wagons, which we're all familiar with how rough some of that terrain in the Powder River is, so it's perfectly reasonable. And if they can't get the wagons through, that kind of defeats the purpose of a road building expedition. And the third problem is the scouts also report seeing signs of a large Indian encampment. So Sawyer's is concerned that if they keep on, they're heading into Indian territory and who knows what's going to happen. So Sawyer's elects to turn around at this point, and his plan is to now return to that camp on Cabala Creek and then go south of the Pumpkin Buttes in modern day Campbell County and reach the Bozeman Trail by heading south of the Pumpkin Buttes. So they turn around and on August 13th, one of their teamsters, a 19-year-old kid by the name of Nathaniel Hedges, he is scouting about a mile ahead of the main party looking for water. He finds water at a bone pile, at bone pile creek, but in addition to the water, he also finds a group of Cheyenne Indians. And so they ambush uh, Nathaniel Hedges and kill him. And another 19-year-old teamster, uh, Albert Holman, he wrote that they recovered the body and found Hedges' body riddled with arrows and that he had been scalped. 
So after the Indians kill uh, Hedges, they make a run for Sawyer's main party with the goal of running off Sawyer's uh, herd and livestock. And Sawyer's and his men are able to rally and at least temporarily uh, shoot. Uh, they're able to rally and temporarily drive the Indians off. So Sawyer's then elects to make camp as the sun is setting in a small knoll overlooking Bone Pile Creek. And this is where they camp through the night. Uh, one of the privates writes that no one was able to sleep because of fear of an Indian attack. And so we have a picture here. I was able to visit the site back in uh, June when it was super green out. And then Albert Holman, who was um, wrote an account, he was with the expedition uh, in 1912, so 47 years after the fight, he revisited the site. And so we have a picture of him and his account, but his account was 47 years after it. So there's kind of question about how good his memory was with some of it. Uh, so during the next day, August 14th, the fighting, uh, Sawyers, they sent some of the soldiers up on top of the bluffs around to act as lookouts. And so one of the lookouts was a private Jarvis, and he was up on one of the uh, bluffs, and he heard a noise, turned around, saw about 10 to 12 giant Indians trying to sneak up on him. So he made a run for it. And in Holman's accounts, he writes that um, Jarvis made off of the speed of the wind with the Indians hot on his heels, and he made it back to camp with only the loss of his hat. And so we have this um, artwork done in 1930 by Laura Aldridge, which is down in Cheyenne at the State Museum. And you can see that Jarvis is making a run tour towards his horse with his hat flying off. So um, our artist, Laura Aldridge, is obviously using Holman's account to pick up and get the details for the painting. So this is the bone pile site today. So Aldridge is painting while it's really cool. She does kind of exaggerate some of the bluffs around. But this is about 10 miles south of Gillette, Wyoming. And today, at the very top of the photo is uh, Highway 50. And there's a popular wedding venue, Prairie, um, Prairie View wedding venue there. So nowadays, people are getting married there, which is just kind of interesting how things change. So after, um, after Jarvis's flight for life, the Indians temporarily back off, and so Sawyers uses that time to try and make a run for it. So they elect to move from the Bone Pile site to Cavallo Creek, back to their camp there, which is about 10 miles further downstream. And so, yeah. So then the next day, August 15th, they're camped along Cavallo Creek, and there is a bit of a peace tree. So under the a white flag of truce, Sawyers meets with the Indians, and the Indian that he talks to is George Bent, if we remember from Sand Creek. So Bent, he was, to use the uh, terminology of the time, a half-breed. His father was William Bent, a notable fur trader who established Bent's Fort down in Colorado. And uh, Bent's mother was a Cheyenne. So he, and he grew up and he went to boarding school in Missouri. So he knew how to speak English and knew uh, the ways of the white men. So it made him a good interpreter. So Sawyers and Bent meet. And they agree that in exchange for a wagon load of goods, that the Indians will leave the expedition alone. There's a problem with that. If we remember that we had um, Captain Wilford concerned that the army was running out of supplies, now you just want to give a wagon load of supplies to the Indians. That creates even further tension between Wilford and Sawyers. And so Sawyers writes that the majority of his party were discontented with this treaty because they thought that they were just buying off the hostiles, as he put it and they're concerned about the lack of supplies. What happens next is a little unclear in the historical record, but it looks like after the peace uh, deal, there's trading being done between the white soldiers and the Native Americans. And so two of the um, soldiers, a private Anthony Nelson and a private John Rouse, were trading with the Indians, and something goes astray because the next thing anybody knows, shots are being fired. Uh, private Nelson is killed and Private John Rouse goes missing, and they're once again in a firefight between Sawyer's expedition and the Native Americans. And Sawyer's writes at this point that they open up fire with their 12-pound mountain howitzers, so that cannonball there, and they're able to kill many of the Native Americans' ponies. And so at that point, the Native Americans um, end the fight. And so there's a little bit of question. So Private Anthony Nelson, he's killed, and his body was recovered by the expedition. John Rouse, his body was not found. So that leaves both uh, Holman and Griggs and their accounts to write that they think he deserted and joined with the Indians, but it's a little unclear as to what happened. 
So it took some uh, drone shot of the Kabayak Creek area. So that's Highway 59, the Douglas Highway. We're looking north towards Gillette, about 10 miles away. And that little bridge is where Kabala Creek uh, passes under the highway. And as it pans around, uh, looking more west, that those bluffs are where the bone pile site is. And then it'll pan around um, and then start looking eastward and we can see the main Cabalo coal mine. So the fact that there's a coal mine there kind of acts to our advantage because there has been some archeological work done there. And I'm not a professional archeologist, but um, in 1997, they did a dig there and they recovered uh, musket balls. Uh, they recovered uh, military buttons, which I have one up here you guys can see. The one thing they did not find at the Cabalo site that they expected was um, percussion caps, spent percussion caps which leads them to conclude in their um, archaeological report that the main fighting did indeed take place at Lone Pile, and Cabala was just a secondary, it was just a campsite, that the main battle was at Lone Pile about 10 miles away. And here are some of the um, musket balls that they found that correspond with the 1863 <laughs> Springfields that Sawyer's men would have been armed with. And just a topo map uh, showing the location of the bone pile site and the Cabalo site. And that they're both um, about 10 miles south of Gillette, and bone pile sits on Highway 50, Cabalo on 59. So kind of easy to get to. So I've been talking about Sawyers, but let's go and go back to our B plot with General Connor. So meanwhile, while um, on the very same day Nathaniel Hedges was killed at Bone Pile. Uh, General Connor, he's making his way northward following the Bozeman Trail, and his scouts are led by a guy, uh, Captain Frank North, who he also lived, lived a very interesting life. He later went on and worked with Buffalo Bill Cody and his Wild West show, so he was another colorful character. So General, or excuse me, Captain North is leading a group of Pawnee scouts, and they come across a camp of Cheyenne at Crazy Woman Creek, so the picture of Crazy Woman crossing I-90. And they get into a firefight with the Cheyenne. Captain North's horse is shot out from under him, but he's undeterred by that. And he pursues the Cheyenne down the crazy woman. Ultimately, um, three days later to their main camp at Powder River. And Captain North is able to take the Cheyenne by surprise and him and his, men, his Pawnee killed 24 uh, Cheyenne. And so that was the main camp that at least I'm theorizing that Sawyer's scouts had seen the few days before that convinced Sawyer's to turn around. And I'm also kind of speculating here because I don't have uh, great accounts from the Native Americans, but my thinking is that um, why the Native Americans left Sawyers alone at, at Caballo Creek was because they got word of Connor's men coming up the powder. So they took off and headed back towards the crazy woman because after the um, John Rouse and Nelson private incident, uh, Sawyers, he sends his scouts out and they report that the Cheyenne have indeed moved north. So I'm thinking George Bent and his Cheyenne are going north to try and intercept um, Frank North and his forces. But regardless, that leaves the road clear. So Sawyers and his men, they're able to go south of the Pumpkin Buttes, find the Powder River and find Fort Reno. And Fort Reno had been established just a week before by General Connor as he was moving up the powder. So we have the etching from 1867 but the fort would not have been that built up when Sawyers got there, being that the fort was only a week old at that point. So Connor, meanwhile, he's continuing up the Bozeman Trail. And when he gets north of Sheridan near Ranchester, his, another one of his scouts is again, famous mountain man, Jim Bridger enters our story again. Bridger's with Connor. And the story is that Bridger sees smoke off in the horizon and while Connor can't see it, even with his binoculars, he's smart enough to trust Bridger. And so Bridger leads a bunch of scouts to confirm that there is indeed a Native American village there. And General Connor, um, the next day, August 29th, he, lay, he um, attacks the village and kills 63 Arapaho warriors and takes uh, women and children and a lot of the ponies from the Arapaho um, captive. 
So while Connor is engaging in a battle by Ranchester, Wyoming on the Tongue River, Sawyers is making his way north. He's about where Buffalo is at this point. So completely unaware that things are happening on the Tongue River. So being completely oblivious, Sawyers continues north. He reaches the Tongue River. And when he's getting to the Tongue River, uh, one of his scouts, a Captain Cole, is ambushed by the Arapaho and killed. The Arapaho aren't making any distinction between Connor's men and Sawyers' men. They just see a bunch of white soldiers, so they blame them for the ambush. So they begin attacking Sawyers and his party. So Sawyers and his forces, they corral along the Tongue River, and we now get a two-week standoff. So once again, Sawyers wakes up, this time to find two to 300 Arapaho warriors surrounding his camp. So again, Sawyers raises the white flag of truce, finds out about the battle this uh, Arapaho had gotten into the ambush of Connor against the Arapaho. And so Sawyers and the Arapaho, they agree to send three men each, so three Arapaho and three of Sawyers' men, to try and find General Connor. The Arapaho, they want their women and children back and their, uh, in, and their horses. And Sawyers, he's trying to alert Connor to send reinforcements to try and help him out. And so it takes two weeks because things weather-wise have completely changed. So back in August, it was super dry, super, uh, very much a drought. And now the reports are that there's thunderstorms every day, there's torrential rain, things are a muddy mess, and that all the creeks and rivers are rising. So that's making travel very difficult. But eventually the um, party is able to find Connor, and Connor agrees to send reinforcements to Sawyers in the form of the Second California Cavalry. So I said that uh, Sawyers and his men were camped on Tongue River for two weeks. During that two weeks, the men get frustrated with Sawyers and his command's already been undermined with all of his uh, arguments with Captain Wilford. And so the men, they mutiny against Sawyers and they vote to relieve him of command. Sawyer says that they're acting in impulsively, so he invites them to have a second vote, which they actually do, and they still vote to relieve him. And they vote to head back south to Fort Reno. So just as they're packing up to head and depart from Fort Reno, uh, Captain Albert Brown of the 2nd California Cavalry shows up. So the Arapaho got wind that um, the California Cavalry was on the way. So they departed. So Sawyers and his men are taking that opportunity to get the heck out of there. Captain Brown shows up, asks what the heck is going on, finds out Sawyers has been mutinied against. He tells the men that the punishment for mutiny on the plains is death. And so the uh, mutineers decide to put Sawyers back in charge. A little bit of a question whether Albert Brown, captain, could have um, actually executed anybody since the Sawyers men were civilians, but the threat alone was enough to restore Sawyers to command. So from this point on, Sawyers and his men, they cross the Tongue River, and then they follow on um, the Bozeman Trail into Montana, and without incident, they arrive at Virginia City on October 12th. So was the Sawyer's expedition a success? If we look at the map, we can say, well, yeah, sort of, because it's a lot shorter than the yellow line shown on the Oregon and Bozeman Trail. Sawyer's route would definitely be a lot more, a lot shorter, but not everyone agreed. Uh, General Dodge, he thought that the expedition was a farce and just a way for the miners to get up to, get up to the gold fields and not actually a road building event as a, um, they planned because they didn't build any bridges or didn't make any modifications that would allow future wagons through. Uh, Sawyers, however, he's undeterred. He returns back east, and then the next year, 1866, he leads a second expedition up to uh, Virginia City, this time without incident. And this time, uh, Holman, in his account, he writes that they're able to recover the body of Nathaniel Hedges. And then ultimately, the Sawyers route was a um, never came to, never really made anything of itself because it faced all the same pro problems as the Bozeman Trail. And then ultimately the railroad coming through kind of made, the railroad coming through and the 68 Fort Laramie Treaty closing down the Powder River uh, for a time meant that Sawyer's route never really came to fruition. And so that is all I've got for you guys. So thank you. And there, are there any questions? Did you find any more information about his 1866 campaign? Not a lot. I found in the um, Virginia City newspaper uh, that he arrived and that they reported there was no Indian attacks and that the, the conditions were not as dry as the year before. Thank you.
But other than that, I haven't really found any other information on that. Yeah, best I can tell, there isn't much. Um, I can't remember the author, but uh, someone had written up uh, as an addendum to um, the main book, I can't think of the name of it, uh, The Sawyer Expedition by Hafen. Okay, I'm sure that's what it is. And, and this other person, I can't remember his name, wrote up a, a, a brief, uh, well, as much as he found it was brief, but the best I can tell that it wasn't, he, he wasn't able to find much on it. Uh, and it was mainly through uh, newspapers, the Niagara Times, I think it was called at that time. Um, I had most of the information in here. Yeah, there's not as much on the 66. But it's interesting, it goes through in 66, after Fort Bill Carney, where all the forts were established, yeah. and they were having so much trouble with the forts, and he isn't part of it. Well, I guess he had a couple of scares, but they don't think he had any pitch battles. Yeah, yeah. The, again, the newspaper, you can only trust it so much because they're trying to make it sound good <laughs> so for people to use the trail, but they were pleased to report that there were no incidents. Hostile Indians, I think, really used, but yeah. What did you use for your source? Uh, so I got uh, both the uh, Sawyer's report to Congress was the big thing I used, as well as Albert Holman's account. And then I can't remember the book. I think it's the Bloody Bozeman Trail, but she includes the diaries of um, Private Griggs and then uh, there was another diary included. It was Sawyers's engineer, who mm -hmm. it pretty much matches Sawyers's account report to Congress. So she, they were thinking that that's his diary is what Sawyers used to write his report. But a lot of the, um, a lot of the accounts are more well. Again, Sawyers's report doesn't really glosses over the mutiny, um, but Holman actually writes about it. Were you, um, were you the one who took the footage? Yeah. Thanks. Have you ever tried to contact landowners to see if you get out there? Uh, so for the bone pile site, I did get in touch. I didn't get any good pictures, unfortunately, but I was able to um, have the landowners take me out because that um, the land is actually, at least this was back in uh, September, I went, it was actually for sale. So um, the landowner did take me out there and I was able to see, and you can see pits in the ground around so there's definitely um, where the rifle pits were and picked up a few metal fragments um so it is really neat right. to go out there the, uh, justin are you uh, available for a question yes ah this is stephen moans um i wanted to ask you if there was any um uh, idea if anybody here in the in the group uh, I grew up out of Dayton on the IXL ranch. And uh, I was wondering if if the uh, there was a lot of reports in the Tongue River that there was a cannon that had been abandoned in the Tongue River uh, around Dayton uh, from the Connor fighter through Ranchester. And it had appeared and disappeared over the years by being upon a river flow and the gravel. But I didn't know if anybody had searched it out or was it a rumor or or what? Because there was a lot of people that reported it, but I never did hear if they ever really found it. So we were having some technical difficulties, so we completely lost you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, Thank yeah, you. we completely missed everything you okay. said. <laughs> okay, uh, I grew up on the ISO in of Dayton, Wyoming. And the uh, uh, question I had was, we had a lot of reports uh, uh, from people out of Dayton and Ranch. I still can't hear. Of people going up and down. You still can't hear? Hello? I'm not working very well, I guess. Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing you. Maybe. Okay, well, I'm I'm not on mute, but I don't know how to turn up the microphone volume here, but neither. Let well, me try. I can hear you really well, you know, so. Oh, okay. 
Well, let me try. Let me try a little closer. See if that helps any. Okay. I was one, There you go. I was wondering if they had found the cannon. They said there was a missing cannon. And no, no, we never. It's there's rumor that um yeah my the director Robert Henning he's heard rumors that they've recovered it but we've never found anything, and that would be super cool to find. But yeah, there was all sorts of rumors over the years uh, growing up. There, when the kids would come back with reports of where this cannon was, and then the river would flood and it was covered over again, and all that. So you never know who was who was uh, yeah, really it seeing it. Yeah, yeah, you never know. But yeah, it'd be super cool to find me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. He was asking if they actually recovered any of the cannon. Uh, as I said, there's rumors that it's at the bone pile site, but nobody's actually verified that. My guess is they probably took it to Virginia City, so it's who knows where at this point. Yeah, and there's another rumor that it's actually off the bridge, uh, the Tom River Bridge, uh, right by the Connertown. Okay, so a lot of rumors. Lots of rumors, yeah. I actually had a good authority, though, uh, someone that I've worked with and he's been around here for a long time. He said his, uh, his kids used to swim in the river and actually stand on the barrel of the cannons. Really? It's, yeah. And yeah, they're not that big of cannons. Like, so. so is there documentation that they lost a cannon? Uh, no. So in his report, Sawyer's never says that he lost a cannon, but that's also not something you would write in your report to Congress. Uh, I lost one of your cannons. <laughs> so. Oh, great. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, thank you. So, um, any other questions? Do you want to show us your, your, your goodies? <laughs> yeah, so. Yes. Yeah, I've got the couple of uh, mustard balls, a button that's got the um, eagle on it for the Union Army, as well as the cannonball from the Mount Howitzer, which is in the, um, the shell casing. So it's got the mustard balls in it. So it'd be filled with black powder. There would be what's called a Borman fuse, which you can see the outline. So it's it would be the Indians call it the gun that goes boom twice. So it goes boom because it's fired out of the cannon. And then when the fired out of the cannon, the Borman fuse would light, it get up over the enemy, and that fuse would ignite the powder. This would burst open and rain down all those rustic shells on the enemy. So that's where the Indians got the name gun that goes boom twice. We got to fire off uh, well, blanks at Fort Laramie, which is always something to see. Even even used as like a signal gun, it's like really impressive. Um, thank you for the members of this session. Um, yeah, any other questions? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>